talking to some friends and family the other day about Christmas, and I, I want to see if you finish a sentence the same way that they did. And then we're talking about the holidays upcoming and all the things that there are to do, and one of the members of my family said, Christmas is just so commercial. You know, that's another sermon for another day, but true. The word that came out of their mouths is, Christmas is so stressful. That's it. That's the word. Christmas is so stressful. And then they proceeded to give a list of all the things they had to do and all the things they had to make and all the things they had to buy and all the places they had to be. And pretty soon, I was as stressed out about their life as they were. And I just asked myself the question, and maybe you can wrestle uh, with it too. I think that is not how Jesus would have us go through this season at all. It's just not. I think he looks down at us in heaven and says, Christmas is so stressful. And he would want to put so many other words at the end of that phrase. Christmas is so peaceful. Christmas is so calm. Christmas is so joyous. Christmas is so loving. Christmas is so healing. Christmas is so forgiving. Christmas is such a place of peace. And I wonder what it would take for us to get to that place instead of the other. The Apostle Paul when he's writing to the church in Philippi, isn't thinking about Christmas so much. He's thinking about the Christian life. But the words that he writes are true any time of year. And he says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. Now, I have to confess I am so far from that scripture sometimes. Are you? Do not worry about anything. Part of me wants to say, I love that, Paul. That's beautiful. I get it. Jesus is in charge. God's got it. You know, I'm invited to come along for the plan, but it really doesn't depend on me a whole heck of a lot. That's just the truth. I understand how I can put my hope, my prayer, my trust, my love, everything in you. And then there's another side of my brain that kicks in and says, but... Shouldn't you worry about it? Shouldn't you grab hold of it? Because this world, let's face it, sometimes this world just throws stuff at us to worry about. Right now, I can make a list of things that if I wasn't careful would just consume me and worry me. The run flat indicator on my Jeep is on. And I haven't checked it out to the degree that I should. I'm worried about that in some degree. I went to the dentist for my routine checkup the other day. My dentist never gives me a list of praises at the end of the visit. What, is, what does he or she do? They give me a list of things to worry about. I have a filling that's going to need to be replaced in the next year. Really looking forward to that, right? These are things that they give us to worry about. And so it's a battle, you see, that we've got going on here between what we really know, how we need to live, and that we trust Christ completely. We could not have moments like the baptism we just had without Him, without His leadership, without the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? These are God-driven kind of things. And Paul's reminding us that God is, we do so much better when God is allowed to stay in charge, but we want to take back control, and as soon as we do, we've just committed a sin, and we begin to feel it because we go off course. Paul doesn't want that to happen. He says, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. If you've got a burden today, and we all do, let it go. Give it to him. Let Jesus take the lead on what you're worried about. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit will begin to move in such a way that our problems are solved and our burdens are lifted in a way that we could never achieve on our own. Just let it go. And in that space, the Spirit has such 
room to move. Paul gives us a clue, too, I think, on how to cultivate that sort of approach, where he says the first sentence before, let your gentleness be known to everyone. And that Paul knows it's that in gentleness that we are in our most, we have our most strength. This week, maybe that's a scripture you and I could memorize so that when we wake up tomorrow, we begin our day with, let your gentleness be known to everyone. If that shaped this week, could that not only change this week, but maybe uh, prepare ourselves so that the Christmas celebration that's coming at us is one that's <laughs> not stressful at all, but a chance to really celebrate the best and the most and the brightest and the most hopeful and the most loving that the birth of Jesus brings us. That's the kind of Christmas that we want. But to have that, maybe Paul is right in that it's our gentleness that needs to prevail in how we act. I don't know about you, but I don't wake up every day kind of that way to say, I want today to be a gentle day. I just, I want to approach everyone that I meet today with gentleness. In fact, it's just the, it's just the opposite. If I have an argument with somebody, I'm like putting on armor, right? I'm, 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 I'm preparing for attack, and I've got my list of things that I'm going to say, and then they're going to say, and then I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say that, and then I'm going to give them a command to show them the right way. I found those conversations with Deborah work so well over 25 years. No, we know this. Let gentleness prevail. And if we cultivate that, what I think Paul is saying to us, if we have a gentle spirit, if we have a gentle heart, if we have a gentle approach to those around us, what happens is worry goes away, in part because what I think gentleness does is it connects our heart to the person we're speaking with. And when there is a connection, there is strength. And where there is strength, there is the chance to prevail. And Jesus knows that. Let gentleness take control and see if that really is the approach that we could have this holiday season. Again, it's tough because there's so much, you know, as we go through life that just make us want to be tense. And they're t I'm no better at this than you are in the sense that there are all sorts of things creep up that we're worried about, you know, and budgets and people and family members and medical conditions. Oh my gosh, the list is so long. All these things can just reach up and grab us. You know, the other day, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I've been on this physical fitness kick, and so I'm on the Peloton bike, which is every other commercial on TV, it seems now. And, uh, and, and so it's, it's, I began my workout, and it's like I'm as tense as I can be. Like I am squeezing the fooey out of the handlebars. And this is a stationary bike. There is no risk of falling off, right? But I am just clinging to this thing with all I've got. And it's the very start of the workout. I don't want to be there. My attitude's bad. My posture's bad. Just, my body is just tense. And, and then the instructor looks at me and says, now I want you to take a deep breath and roll your shoulders back. And I nearly hit her through the screen. I don't want to do that. I'm tense. I'm worried. I've got things going on. I've got a stressful life. But she's, no. Take a deep breath. So I go, you know, and then she says, roll your shoulders back. It's like, you know, and then roll your shoulders forward. It's like, I don't want to do that either. But eventually, eventually, things kicked in, and I did relax, and I had a great workout, but then there were more things to be worried about. I've told you about this physical fitness kick I'm on. I'm 12 pounds down. I want to lose 20. I've got eight to go, and so I'm thinking about this, and I said, Jesus, how in the world am I going to lose eight pounds in the holiday season? You know, because all these church members, they don't bring cauliflower to church. You know, they don't say, Andy, I was thinking about you and praying about you. Here's your garden salad. That doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, what happens is you bring this toxicity to this place. Ooh, I made fudge. Ooh, I made brownies. Ooh, I made this and that. And you wonder why your pastoral staff is 475 pounds. <laughs> it's because you fed us this way. That was a bit of a rant, perhaps. 
But Jesus said, you're going to do this. He said, you, Andy, are going to lose weight during the holiday season. I said, well, how am I going to do that? And then Jesus spoke a word. He said, you're going to do the holiday season differently this time. I went, I'm not happy about that. He said, I don't care if you're happy about that. My job is to love you, not necessarily to like all that you do. So to go through this holiday season, I'm going to have to do things differently. So when I come to your party, to which I hope I'm invited, I have to tell you, I'm not eating. All I want is a piece of celery and a glass of water. (laughs) And I will be the most charming guest, you see. But I've got a greater goal this holiday season, and I can't let your sinful party get in the way of my divine task. Do you see? Do you see how we have to set a different course if we want a different result? And, And maybe what you and I have to think about this holiday season is, The season is stressful because we've made it that way. And what has to happen for us is to say we have to change some things so that it literally becomes a season where we celebrate Jesus' birthday and not make it a festival about ourselves. You see what we've done? We've flipped Christmas in the wrong way. And our culture has made it a time where we glorify ourselves at the expense of him. So let's just reset some basics. We're on the approach to Christmas. Advent, the first season of the Christmas Christian year, is designed to prepare us for Christmas. So that starts next week. Source in the City is doing a thing on Saturday to kind of set a stage of praying our way through Advent. We're also going to have a study guide available to you as individuals or to your Sunday school classes or small groups to kind of work through this Advent season, all of which is designed to proclaim one basic message, really. And the basic message is simply this, is that Christmas is Jesus' birthday. And if it is Jesus' birthday, who should get the gift? That was not encouraging. So let's, uh, let's try that again. It is the Christmas season. We celebrate the arrival of Christ upon the earth. He is born of Joseph and the Virgin Mary. It is Jesus' birthday. So this holiday that's coming at us, how should we celebrate it? If Jesus' birthday, if it's his birthday, who should get the gift? Jesus. That's right. Now don't forget it. It's him who comes first. And so as you look at the thing that we gave you in your bulletin, or if you go to our website, fmhouston.com slash Christmas, there are going to be things that we are doing to celebrate Jesus' birthday that are not about us. And I would encourage you to invest in that, to make that happen. Make a change in the way you go through this holiday season. If you've got young kids, realize the privilege you have to set the example and say Christmas is not about us. Now, we were a family, Deborah and I, and we have kids. In fact, they're here today. And we told them, I said, look, there's going to be a gift for you. But it's going to be a gift. And Christmas has to be about somebody other than us. And I remember several years ago when the kids were young, we went through this and we had this, like we do here at First Methodist Houston, kind of families in need and they've got a wish list. And, and so we pull a little thing off the tree and we make a commitment to go get it. So we do. We go as a family to Target because this was a, this was a lower income family. And one of the things this little girl wanted was a bike. And so we go to Target, and we're looking at all the little bikes, you know, for seven-year-old girls, that sort of thing. And as usual, there's a variety, and and there's a variety of prices. And so, um, you know, I'm starting to look at, you know, the things and what we're going to spend, and I'm kind of thinking about the budget, and I'm worried about that. And uh, I think, I look at the cheapest bike there, and I say, you know, let's get that one. And then the Lord spoke and said, what if it was your daughter? Would you want her on the cheapest bike? And it's like, this is why Jesus is so annoying sometimes. <laughs> it's just, okay, it's just the truth of it, all right? That's called confession. That's... And my daughter was standing next to me. So here we are, and we're trying to make it not about us. And I'm, I'm the pastor of a Christian church, and I'm looking at the cheap bike, and then I look at her, and her brother was standing right next to her. You want him on the cheapest bike? 
So we bought the most expensive bike Target had for a seven-year-old, and I hope she enjoyed it. <laughs> but you see, what happens is, when we make Christmas not about us, the Spirit begins to work in us. And what happens, I'm convinced, over time, is that our heart becomes more like His, which is the point. And it's not just about your kids, it's about you. And it's about the example you are setting. All of us have a sphere of influence. And what Jesus, I think, is so keen to see happen this Christmas season is where we begin to make it more about him. And in that decision, what happens is the spirit moves so that we set a higher example for ourselves and for one another. And as we do that, the kingdom grows. One of the things I always try to be mindful of when I read Paul's letter, Paul's letters, is that Paul's letters almost always, not always, but almost always, are written to communities where being a Christian is very new. So these people who are hearing this letter have not been Christians for generations. Some of them are leaving very pagan lifestyles, making cataclysmic kind of changes about living in a different kind of way. And so Paul is always trying to set the example for them and, and to, to talk to them about make your new faith, your new way of living, your new life, your new hope, to make it a permanent practice. You see, Paul's interested in this transition from this new thing that we take on in the name of Christ, but making it an established part of who we are and what we do. He's trying to redefine the communities that he serves through these letters. And you can even hear that as he talks in Philippians chapter 4, where he says, Finally, beloved, after he's talked all about Christ and the new example and the new life and being a servant and a slave to all like he does in chapter 2, he says, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard, and get this, and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul put himself on the line. He lived the example. He practiced what he preached. And then he appealed to that, to these newest of believers, in this newest of lifestyles, to say, as you go through this, Remember what is good, what is true, what is honorable, what is pure, what is commendable. Remember that. But also remember, as you have seen these things, learn them and the example that I have set for you. And in doing that, he is both honoring, I think, what Jesus did in him. Because remember, Paul, Saul, once crucified Christians, sees there is in Jesus and changes his ways. So he practiced what he preached. He made the change. But then he's asking the Philippians to do the same. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul sets the example, and we should set the example too of what it is to be a Christian in this time. And I'm not sure we realize just how needed that is and how powerful it is. I got a reminder the other day. I don't know how your family does Thanksgiving, but uh, in ours over the years, it's sort of, um, I mean, there's usually about, I don't know, 17 to 20 of us. And so we, we usually have, depending on who hosts, um, two tables, one for the adults and one for the kids. Do you all do this? You have the kids' table, adults' table. And it's always debatable as to who intellectually belongs where, but, you know. In our family, we make it by age, so I get to sit at the adults' table. And, uh, well, I, I've, I've noticed something. Deborah and I were talking about this the other day, uh, and we've seen it over the last several years. What's, what's interesting in our family is, is that um, when we look to the kids' table, they aren't kids anymore. And uh, they're all young adults at the kids' table. And they're doing very adult things, like getting an education. A few of them are married. They've got responsible jobs. and They're making a very adult and impactful kind of decisions. 
And it occurred to me that uh, this adult table that I'm currently on, I am rapidly aging out of. And one day, they're going to be there. And they're going to be setting the example. And whatever our family is about at Thanksgiving and Christmas, they will decide. And I just wonder what they've received from us. Have they received the example that they've needed? And I pray they have. You might want to give some thought to this kind of stuff too this holiday season. What example are you setting? Is it time to make a change and say, you know, let's really make it about Jesus because he's the only life there is. And when we live like him, when we value his values, when our heart is his heart, that's life. And that's the example you and I are called to live through the scriptures, through the Apostle Paul, through the witness of one another in moments like baptism, through the encouragement of the saints. We are called to set the example in our time, and let's make a commitment today, all of us, to make that happen. Pray with me.